Thanks for playing. <laughs> Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Good morning. If you haven't been over there, by well, yeah. Well, yeah, you've all been over there. Yeah, so we got a great temptation trade today in honor of Pastor Appreciation Day. Uh, the neat thing is they have Pastor Appreciation Month with this October, the whole month of October. So, uh, so Terry and I started down this little adventure about eight years ago when we uh, started up Grace Street Church along with our lovely wives. And uh, so it's been an honor and a privilege to serve alongside you this entire time. Look forward to many things to come in the future. So, but anyway, your mic went off. Do what now? Huh? Your mic went off. My mic went off. Went off, off. Off, off. There it goes. Okay. I moved away from my mouth. So. Ah, anyway, <laughs> if you're watching online today, please let us know. Say hi, so we know you're there with us this morning. Uh, and we have a lot of great things coming up here in the near future. One of the first things we're going to talk about here, because this season is approaching us very, very, very quickly, is that uh, we have an Advent reading sign-up sheet. And so we've got a clipboard here if you're interested in doing one of the Advent readings. Um, please sign up on here, and the dates are December 1st, 8th, 15th, and 22nd. So if you're interested in that, we have a clipboard here. I'll leave it up front here. Anyone who wishes to uh, sign up for that would be welcome to do so. So, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And it's a beautiful day outside. A little bit crisp, which is nice because it's fall weather. Um, we do have some cold weather moving in tomorrow and Tuesday. So, if you've got plants outside that you want to keep yet, you may want to bring them inside because it's supposed to frost. So, we have that coming for us. Uh, today we continue our sermon series based on the season four of The Chosen, and then join us Wednesday. We're going to watch then episode five as we go through. It's hard to believe we only have three more episodes left. However, uh, Dallas Jenkins made a, a, an announcement yesterday. So I got an email from them, and they have a new uh, Christmas movie coming out in theaters on November 8th. And if you go to the movie, get your tickets to go to the movie. It's the best Christmas pageant ever. So there's some actors in there from The Chosen that will be in the movie. Um, November 8th, they're going to show the movie. And then at the end of the movie, then they're going to show you a clip, some previews of Season 5. So a little quick preview to come in there to uh, catch up with Season 5 as well. Well, our next men's breakfast is going to be November 2nd in here. And uh, we were kind of chatting this morning about different things and some things that we may be trying to do. And so it'll be kind of fun. Uh, men's breakfast is always a really good time. So if you have a friend or someone you'd like to invite, they're more than welcome. 9 o'clock a.m. on the 2nd. Then following that in the afternoon, uh, evening actually, on the 2nd, we'll be showing the movie The Nativity. And this is a very, very well done movie. And it is uh, the nativity as experienced from Mary's point of view. And uh, it's a very good movie, so it promises a fresh look at that uh, nativity and, and what's going on in the birth of Christ. And that'll be at 6 o'clock on November 2nd. Then, the big date. The big date. We had orange track racing here yesterday. We had the season finals for... Season 19 wraps up then November 9th, and then uh, so we'll have all the stuff. We had the cases full of cars, all the winners, so it's double elimination and all kinds of fun stuff going on there. Um, Used a little bit longer session for us in there that day, um, but it'll be a great time. And then after that's done, we convert the track over for season 20. We'll have blue track. And then Terry went out Friday to Blue Track, out in Anamosa, where we get our track from. Uh, the great people out there, we needed some divided track to go down so we could split for our finish line. They donated it to us, free of charge. So please thank them. Uh, go online and thank them, put a nice word on their websites as well. 
Uh, so we have that coming up then for season 20. It'll be kind of a whole new experience in orange track racing on blue track. So we we'll, might have to throw some paint on the stuff and make it orange. Uh, anyway, so today's worship uh, songs and the message and the movie trailer and everything will be posted up then in our notes for those online today. Make sure you uh, take that out because we take some good time curating those messages so that they will fit in with what our message today is kind of reinforces everything that that uh, God is talking to us about. So let us enter into a time of worship right now. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for giving us time for us to gather together here freely and openly to worship you today, to bring honor and glory to your words and to your name today. Lord, we seek you first in all that we say and all that we do, and that keeps us in line with you and with your Holy Spirit that dwells within us. We praise you and thank you for those opportunities. We ask for healing for those who need it. We ask for uh, safe travels for those who are traveling. <clears throat> that can't be with us here today. We ask for your word and your message to go throughout the world and to bring hope and salvation to a desperate, desperate time in our world, a very dark world. Lord, as we come into this time of worship, open our ears to hear your message, open our eyes to see the glory of the world that you have created for us today, and especially open our hearts to receive that message in so that we can live it out each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from Matthew 6, verse 33, and this is from the New Living Translation. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Now, a lot of people misinterpret this, <laughs> and they use it for a Christmas list. Oh, God, I, I, I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that, but... It doesn't say he will give you everything you want. It says he will give you everything you need. But there's a couple of things about it. You have to seek first the kingdom of God above all else, meaning that is the most important. That's what you center your life on. And live righteously. And then he will give you everything you need, not want. So it's not a Christmas list time. But this passage in Matthew is based on discipleship, because that's what we do as a disciple, is we seek the kingdom of God in all of our learning, to go through study, to read our Bible, to read the word, to come to worship, to gather and fellowship together. That is what is being a disciple. That is what being a disciple is all about. Seeking the kingdom of God. So as a, as a disciple, as a Christian's first priority is to seek and find and follow then, as it says in here, follow the will of God. That is living righteously. And that is the way God's kingdom advances then. That's how we advance through the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is a dynamic reality. It's not a static idea. It's dynamic. It moves and changes with us. It grows with us. The kingdom of God grows with us. Our knowledge of the kingdom of God grows as we grow in our relationship to God. And it is God breaking into history to redeem and, re and, uh, to redeem and rule all those who live responsibly, and live under God's rules and his reign. And that is seeking his kingdom above all things in the world. He's willing to give the kingdom to all who are willing to make a covenant with him through faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. As our Lord and Savior. The church should be an example of God's kingdom on earth. In that, the church, the family of God's believers, should endeavor to advance the kingdom in all that it says and all that it does. And if we have a church that's not doing that, we had a pretty good lively discussion on that last Wednesday night. But the kingdom should be advanced through the church. The church isn't the building. The church is the family of God gathered together in his name. That is what the church is. And so we should do, seek the kingdom above God all, above all else and live 
righteously. So, <clears throat> God desires that all of his people receive his gracious gift, the kingdom. And the kingdom is not a political power that terrorizes people out there. It's Christ's rule of love which casts out fear, surrounds them in grace, and shows them mercy in all things. In other words, the kingdom of God mirrors what Jesus did and set as a living example for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for your word today. We thank you for this message and if we follow your word, you show us exactly what it's needed to have a kingdom mind. A mindset that is not of the world, but of, of your kingdom and of your will. And in doing so, then you will give us what we need to have a fulfilled life. And that's a, just a great thing, a wonderful thing that you have put in time memoriam for us as long as we seek you in live a righteous life, all these things will be given unto us as well. So we praise you and thank you in that, in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. We have a visitor at the window. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. I think it's a hornet. I think you're right. Came in from the back. Well, I don't <coughs> So he he uh, he wanted to see first the uh, kingdom of God. And he just sent her I guess he's going to be right now. So Oop, hey, oh, there he goes. <laughs> Sorry, my friend. All right. From there was no catch the release hatch in there. But they're scary. I was stung as a three-year-old in the sandbox by one of those and mom plastered. I'm thinking of Jesus you make a lot of people see. She plastered mud all over my face. Take care of that. It helped. Go figure. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, little buddy. Um, this was an interesting uh, episode to write about. We've talked about this before, Mark has, I have. They take some creative license in writing this, and so there's some filler, and it really does make the episode very watchable, but we also have to remember the lessons in it. And As I was looking at all the different, and there were multiple different uh, things that we could be talking about today. But whether we are Christian or not, especially not, understanding God's ways can be, well, difficult. Why does God do this? Or why does God do that? Yesterday I, get a, I texted my daughter to see how she was doing after her surgery. And she never responded with, oh, I'm doing better. She goes, she'll never guess who contacted me out of the blue. And it was her mom's widowed husband, her former stepdad, or her stepdad. And he had some things that he was sending to her over two years after her passing. And so she was excited about that. For whatever reason, he's been radio silent all this time, but God laid it up on his heart to contact her on her mom's birthday and send her these items. Don't understand God's timing and things, but he has his ways. And even as Christians, we have to look through the lens of God, of, of the word of God and not of the world. If we see things through the lens of the world, what do we do? We get frustrated. We, we misunderstand and, and we get discouraged. In fact, I was telling Mark yesterday about something that discouraged me and frustrated me, and I was just mad. And to be quite honest, I was trying to write this message, and I'm going through this, and I could not focus. I told him during the devotion time yesterday that I just 
Not at Diane, but I unleashed all that frustration, all that discouragement. And then the person that I was frustrated and discouraged with finally quit texting and called. <laughs> finally was able to speak. And then that, oh yeah, oops, not bad. They were not all, were not perfect. But these are the things that the disciples went through as well. I mean, in, in this uh, episode, we see Judas, he's all frustrated about multiple different things throughout this episode. In this episode, Jesus and the disciples are on the way to the home of Lazarus. And along the way, now, they are approached by Roman soldiers who tell them to drop their own belongings and to carry their equipment. Now, like other aspects of the series, what we've talked about, there is nothing in scriptures that says this actually happened. There's no record of it. But there isn't anything that says it did not. In fact, it happened a lot. So, what we do know is that Jesus said something about this type of situation. He's talking about revenge in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 5, 41 and 42, he says, If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. This was going to happen. It was the law. So it's not an ask. It's a demand. But the distance, there was a cap on it. The, the distance that they could take and make them carry that gear was only a Roman mile. So, you starting to understand where that phrase, going the extra mile, comes from? The response of the people would be varied. Could you imagine? Roman group of Roman soldiers comes up and takes their helmet off, puts it on your head, hands you their pack, their shield, and their sword. Ladies, you didn't have to do this. It's just for the men. But it didn't matter your age. It didn't matter how strong you were. It didn't matter if you were sick or not. You did this one thing. So the, the response of the people would not have been a positive one. But the thought comes to my mind is, what's keeping us from going the extra mile for someone else? Instead of, and, and remember I said this was from his teaching on revenge, so instead of getting even, we should do good to those who have wronged us. So hence Jesus' teaching He's teaching us how to seek the kingdom of God above all else. By praying for those who have wronged you, God will give you the strength to love the way he loves. Now, in this episode, we see them get to the mile point. The soldiers say, all right, give us back our stuff. And here's Jesus. He's got a helmet on. He's got one of the packs and he just keeps walking. Everybody's looking at him. The soldiers are looking at him like, where are you going? The disciples are looking at him like, what are you doing? He says, come on, let's go. By going the extra mile, he's really stripping away this demand, this force. Uh, servitude and breaking into freedom and saying, I'm going to go the extra mile for you. And so they do. What's the example that that teaches? The soldiers are going to have a different experience than the disciples. The disciples were still carrying that stuff, right? They're probably a little ticked. Like, what are you doing? Why are you making us carry it longer? We were supposed to be able to stop here. Why are we going further? And Judas was one of them that was, he was like pretty upset about this. This is one of the times that he got upset and wanted to know, why Jesus, why are we going that extra step? But along the way in this episode, we see the soldiers start to take back their stuff. They didn't like the fact that 
they were going the extra mile. It had an effect on them. I talk about a lot when you're preaching the Word of God. Sometimes you can use words. Other times, use your actions. They went from being in servitude to having control over the situation. And in doing so, they were living righteously and not playing the victim. Now, seeking the kingdom of God is not always at the top of our minds. It's, it's not as tangible as serving those who are right in front of us, right before us. <coughs> However, it is if we get too focused on the earthly things, we can miss what God has for us. Been there, done that. Look at what happened to Martha and Mary. Let's go to Luke 10, 38 and 42. It says, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed them into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, Martha loved Jesus just as much as Mary did. And both, are, as we're going to find out here, are serving God, but in different ways. They're serving Jesus in different ways. Martha was worried about all the earthly parts of serving Jesus as she prepared the meal. Who's found out somebody's coming over for dinner, somebody's coming over to the house for a celebration, and you go and rage clean? Nobody else has to answer it. That would be me. Where's the Swiffer? Where's, you know, where's the broom? Where's the vacuum cleaner? Let's get this house cleaned up. In fact, I saw, I shared this with Diane this past week. There's a video of a guy. He gets on the phone. He says, hey, can I come over? Yeah, I'll be there in about 30 minutes. 45 minutes later, the guy calls him back and says, you thought you are going to be here in 30 minutes. He said, no, I wasn't planning on coming over at all. I just cleaned my entire house. Yeah, I know. Don't you remember I t you told me to call you once or twice a month and tell you I was coming over in 30 minutes? And he would rage clean the house. But it was funny because it's so true. But that's kind of what she was doing. She was scrambling around trying to get the house straightened up and trying to prepare a meal for Jesus. But Mary, she was serving Jesus by sitting at his feet, listening and learning. Now, you can't tell me you haven't been frustrated with another Christian because of the way they were serving Jesus. They're not serving Jesus the right way. They're not doing it. It's kind of like, that's not the way you should worship. That's not the kind of music you should play. You shouldn't play anything but the organ. Nope. Or it's only guitar, not any instruments at all, just straight a cappella. There's actually a denomination out there that is just a cappella. And that's all right. That's how they choose. But I have to imagine Luke left out the colorful part of the conversation. Could you imagine? In, just imagine people you know, Diane can imagine it because she knows me, that frustrated, I can't believe it, stomping around. She's stomping around the house. She's probably out in the kitchen or the preparation area, and she's not setting the bowls or the plates or whatever she's using down. She's probably putting them down with a little extra force so that you can hear it. It's like... <sighs> and then she goes out and she's like, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you? And he's like, yeah, 
you gotta wonder what Jesus look on his face was like, Mary, Mary, Martha, Martha, Martha. You're so worried about the wrong things. But I've been in her shoes and I've done those things and I'm sure more, but neither Martha nor I remembered the important part, seeking the kingdom of God. Instead of serving with a kingdom heart, we served with frustration. We served being discouraged. Our hearts were not in the right place. We basically misunderstood the assignment. Martha thought she was serving Jesus when in fact she was so busy that she was actually neglecting him. We all do this when we're focused on the earthly things. Now, it may be that we're focused on a specific situation. Maybe we're focused on how someone is treating us. Maybe it's we're focused on watching that. Oh, you know, NCIS and FBI start this week. Clear the schedule. Got to watch those. Watch the TV or maybe, I don't even have it on with me. I left it back there. Maybe we're staring at our phones or tablets, or as they call them now, screens. It covers everything. Other times we might be doing something else with family or friends and totally missing the moment because of some other distraction. The sad part is this, this can happen even in our time when we're spending with God. In my devotional time, I, I, I grab my cup of coffee, I go sit on I, in what we call our comfy chair, and I get into the Word. But then life happens, and things start to creep in. Oh, I need to do this today, and I need to do that. Pretty soon, I have read a whole page and missed all of it. It's like driving down the road, talking on the phone, or singing with the radio, and then suddenly wondering, was that green or red? Was there a camera at that one? Am I going to get a ticket? Don't let the moment slip by and miss out just because you got distracted. Don't be like Martha. Don't be like me. Don't let your service become self-serving. Jesus did not beat Martha up over it, though. He gave her grace. He just simply said, Martha, this is a paraphrase, he said, Martha, set your priorities. Get, them, get your priorities straight. Get your priorities where they should be. Yeah, it can be a lot of fun sending, you know, to get on Facebook and Instagram and send those reels to your loved ones, your kids, your wife, your husband, or even the TikToks to your friends and family. Just don't do it in a way where you're going to miss out on your time with it. Martha was missing out on her time with Jesus. And yeah, there are important things that need to get done. We have to pay our bills. We have to keep the house up. Just don't do it at the expense of your eternity. There's a saying that has stuck with me for years. And this, is, this comes from work. It, it was, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when will you? But I, I'm going to tweak that a little bit, and, and it could easily be this. If you don't have time to spend with God now, when will you? We need to be looking at life from a kingdom perspective, continuously seeking the kingdom. Jesus teaches us about seeing things from a kingdom perspective in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard that he is teaching in a scene in this episode. And we'll go to Matthew 21 and 16 for this. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. 
At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and he saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and he saw more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only in one hour and you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So that those who are last now will be first then. And those who are first will be last. Now, fast forward 2,000 years to today and try and get away with something like that. How do you think that's going to go over with the workers? I mean, the news is absolutely full of people who are upset because they're not making enough money. I remember starting off in the workforce when I was a kid, the minimum wage was $3.35 an hour. Some of you may have been more, some of you may have been less. But because I was a student, there was a special wage for us. You got paid $2.85 an hour for the first 20 hours you worked. Now people are complaining because they want to make $15 an hour working in an entry level position. Others are quitting their jobs in search of higher paying jobs. And you know, the sad part is they quit them before they find that other job. And then they rely on others to take care of them. Oh, and don't, let's not forget the strikes because we're being underpaid. We're not, we're getting paid a hundred dollars an hour, but that's not enough. We want more. In a world that is out for itself, an actual event like this parable would have landed people in jail because they would have been in, there would have been fighting. Well, between jail and the hospital, there would have been people in both, probably. But that's not the point of this parable. Again, that's looking at this strictly from a earth, an earthly perspective, not a kingdom perspective. We've got to look at it from God's point of view and not a human point of view. So let's look at it from a kingdom perspective. Here Jesus is telling us that interest into God's kingdom is not by works, but by grace alone. And if you haven't already figured it out, God's the landowner. We believers, we're the workers. And in a world that the mantra is, it's not what you know, but who you know, this parable doesn't fly. People are so wrapped up in their lineage. They're so wrapped up in how they expect to be treated in a certain way because of that. Or people are wrapped up in their position because I'm higher than you. You're just a little minion. The higher, the better. I mean, this is what led James and John to ask Jesus, Hey, we want to sit at your right and at your left in your kingdom. And if you remember watching the episode, you don't know what you're asking. And they didn't. But in time, they were going to find out. But even then, as people do today, people accept, expect and demand 
to be served. You don't have to go far to see the state. Just go to a store. Go to a restaurant. Come sit next to me while I talk to a customer. And listen to how people treat those who are trying to take care of them. People treat others horribly because they have this sense of entitlement. We talked about that earlier with those Roman soldiers. In the second scene of the episode, or the soldiers treated the disciples horribly. They belittled them and they jo made jokes about them as they were walking along, but all that stopped at mile marker one. And they saw what the people were doing. We need to treat people better. Now, in our second scene of this episode, and I'm kind of bouncing around the episode a little bit here, but the, in the second scene of the episode, we walk into a, or we are exposed to a debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are far enough away that, well, they're not that far away. They're yelling and they're hollering and they're arguing and they're, it's not a debate, it's an argument. And it devolved to that point because they were debating one thing, the resurrection. And if you remember, the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, whereas the Pharisees do. And in this scene, Shmuel and Yusuf leave during the debate to discuss the fact that Yusuf has just joined the Sanhedrin, or kind of like the Supreme Court, the 70 seat Supreme Court. And Shmuel asks Yusuf, Why didn't you use your family's money sooner to get a seat? Yusuf he said, well, I felt I needed to serve the people first. But in the end, he does use his family's money to get his seat. By contrast, Shmuel used his family's influence. So remember when we talked about before, we were talking about lineage and we were talking about position. People are using those to get ahead. And regardless of how you look at this, they're both playing a political game for personal gain. This parable, when seen through a kingdom lens, would have spoken to not only these people, but also to the disciples. Jesus is adamant that we be treated with grace, and that's what this parable of the vineyard workers is about. When seen through a kingdom lens, it was not only spoken to the people that were around him, but also the disciples. But think about it, they have spent a lot of time with Jesus. Wouldn't it be easy for them to have started to feel, oh, I've spent two years with Jesus. In fact, in the, as we're watching these episodes, we've been with Jesus since the beginning. This is James and John trying to justify their reason for saying, let us sit the right and left. We've been with Jesus for longer than you have. We've done more for him than you have. All of a sudden here we have position creeping in again. You know who's best to hear that message? New believers. Why? Because they haven't been corrupted yet by all the garbage that the believers were already kind of getting sucked into. This would be one that would reassure those new believers of God's incredible grace. Jesus teaches us that God is both fair and generous when it comes to his grace. Everyone that worked that day received the same pay. Every week we pray together. In fact, there's a list on the back table there. There's a list of people that we pray come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We are praying for their very salvation. We cannot do that if we do not expect God to give them the same thing that he has given us. 
if we were to complain to God that a person who accepted his amazing gift of grace and salvation shouldn't receive the same thing that we've received, well, we better get on our, hand, on our knees and pray. You can get prostrate and you better pray. Your heart ain't right. Because of sin, none of us deserve eternal life. None. Hard pill to swallow. I personally do not care if you make your decision in your final moments of life. I just want to see you in the kingdom. I want you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I mean, we're kind of halfway between Easter last year and Easter next year, right? But think about it. The two criminals on either side of Jesus. One kept mocking him and the other one was like, yeah, I think I screwed up. And what does Jesus tell him? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. He repented because he realized who Jesus was. I think we're all going to be in it for a bit of a surprise. We're going to get to heaven. We're going to see people we didn't expect to see there. I mean, rumor has it, there's been mass murderers who have accepted Christ before they died. That's kind of a hard pill to swallow right now. They did all that, but yet they're in the kingdom. God's grace works that way. Those who resent that God would allow the despised, the outcast, and the sinners into eternity with him need to seriously examine their hearts. And I admit, in an earthly fashion, I've been jealous of others in their circumstances for things that they may have gotten. Oh, wow. They were able to get that, or they were able to do this, or whatever the case may be. But that's an earthly perspective. I have been self-righteous in judging others for the circumstances that they have put themselves in. That's your decision. You've got to suck it up and live with it. Yeah, that's not the way it's supposed to work. That's not a kingdom perspective. I've been upset with friends and family for the poor decisions they've made. I'm not going to help you out of that. You made, you, you caused it. You look, no, no. Go help them out. Help them to learn what God's grace is about. Instead of being upset, instead of getting all judgy, instead of getting jealous, what should I have done? I should have prayed for them. I should have prayed before I even opened my mouth. Before I started to think the thoughts that I thought. I should have prayed for to God that he made me happy for the people who had come into good fortune. I should have prayed that God would use me or someone else to help the person through the circumstance that they had found themselves in. I should have prayed that God would give them the wisdom to make better choices in the future. I should have been seeking the kingdom of God above all else. That we should rejoice when God is gracious towards others and not resent it. As the children of God, the benefactors of his amazing grace, we need to live it, sh live it, show it, and share it. So back to Matthew 6, 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And everything you need is not earthly. It's your eternity. So how do you know if you're putting God's kingdom first? Well, ask yourself this question. When I need guidance to make decisions, where do I go first? For many Christians, God is like a genie in a bottle. Let's just rub the side of the lamp or the whatever and only go to him when all else fails or when we need or want something. He's the fallback plan. Plan B. 
when he should be the first choice. When you need something, when you need anything, seek God first. Go to him in prayer. Ask him. Do you pray and study the scriptures or do you just go to the world and ask them first? Do you ring your best friend and say, oh, this will happen, will happen, happen. No, go to God first. We've all done it. I admitted as much earlier. Well, here's what I can tell you from my experience. I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but it doesn't turn out well when we go to the world first. We need to be kingdom-minded Christians and seek God's view and his righteous standards. If we do this, if you do this, you will find freedom when someone demands something of you. You will not miss out on what God is teaching you because you were too busy. I know somebody who said this once. I heard it on the radio in a really deep voice. He said, a busy Christian is not necessarily a good Christian. And the third thing is you will understand the grace that God offers everyone who calls on his name and believes in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let us be kingdom minded. Jesus was being kingdom minded. He taught the soldiers and the disciples each different lessons. He taught Mary and Martha different lessons. In the episode, we see Martha and Mary come together and Mary says, I'm sorry. And Martha tells her she's sorry. And they, they come to the understanding that maybe we were both a little wrong. I should have seen, made sure you didn't need any help or maybe just reminded you to come and sit with me at the feet of Jesus. And finally, we have to understand that there is only the grace that God can give us. And we need to mimic that grace with people in this world. That was a hard lesson to relearn again this week. It's a bitter pill to swallow when you realize you were wrong. Heck, I was even wrong on the way here. Somebody's license plate said Doobie, and I'm thinking Lord of the Rings, and no, nope, Trey says, no, that was, that was Harry Potter. I was wrong. That's okay. Father, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to forget to come to you first. But, Father, I, my ask is that you would remind us that we should come to you first. Help us to not get distracted. Help us to not be frustrated and discouraged because if we come to you first, we're going to see things through a kingdom lens. Let us always seek your kingdom. And then when everything else plays out, we can approach others with the same love, the same forgiveness, the same mercy, and the same grace that you give us. And it is only because of those things, Father, that we are made righteous, because we don't, we don't deserve eternal life. But you've freely given it to all who come before you and declare that you are our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into this time of communion this morning, I want you to think of one word, and that is grace. The grace of God, because here by the grace of God go I, this is, this is where we end up. We don't get to heaven except by the grace of God. If you want to know what the grace of God looks like, it's right here. Right here. 
By the blood and the body of Christ, we received grace. We received salvation. Not by our works, not by anything that we can do, but by the grace of God, we receive we receive the kingdom of heaven. He afforded the way for us on the cross for everyone. We're not to exclude anyone from the grace of God. And so as we come into our time of communion, we openly serve communion to anyone who will receive it because they are receiving the grace of God by that. They are accepting Christ into their lives. They are accepting the gift of God given to them freely and openly. No strings attached. No requirements. Except that they believe in Christ. They have faith and belief that Jesus is who he said he is. And that he can do what he says he can do. And by doing that, God gives us the grace to spend eternity with him in his presence. That's what it's about. There are some churches, if you're not a member, you can't take communion. And are they saying, you're not worthy of the grace of God? Yeah, that's exactly it. You don't believe as we do, so therefore you're not worthy of the grace of God. But God says, no, all are worthy through Christ Jesus. He made us worthy. Because we're all unclean. We're all sinners. We're all born into sin. But see, there wasn't a, a qualification to receive God's grace. Except that we believe in Christ Jesus. That who he is. And we accept him into our hearts. I want you to think about that as we take our communion today. And so on the night that... Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it and he told the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Broken is the bond of sin that holds us and keeps us away from God in the breaking of the bread. Later on, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. He is washing us clean from those sins that we just got broke. He released us of those sins and he washes us clean. And he says that we are to partake of the body and the blood each and every time we gather together in remembrance of that gift of salvation, that gift of grace that he afforded us so that we might be able to spend eternity with him. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of God shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 So, um, our prayer professional is not with us today. So she was traveling, they were bringing Jen back from Illinois, and so we hope they had a very good traveling experience, and we give them traveling mercies as well. Uh, we do have some prayers available. We have the prayer sheets on the back of the table. I um, invite you to check those out as well. Are there other people that we need to lift up in prayer today as we come into this time? If not... We do have uh, prayers for Carissa's grandfather, Earl Lockhart. He's in the hospital with a blood infection, low blood pressure, amongst other things. So we want to lift him up today as we lift up all of those as well who were affected um, in their various ways, which we have on our prayer list today. We also want to pray for this broken world that we live in. Um, we want to pray for all of those who were affected by the hurricanes and the fires out west which are still raging on. They, they kind of got overshadowed by the, the hurricane victims. But there are people in dire need, uh, just as there are people in our own hometown that are in dire need uh, of, gar of grace, of mercy, and of care. And that's what we're called in to do. So let us lift all of these people up and lift our broken world up in prayer today. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, 
You are greater than any common disaster that we might face. You're greater than any problem that we face in our world today. Your grace, your mercy, your love overshadows any of those things. We need to accept that grace. We need to accept your mercy. We need to accept your love today, which will overcome the things of this world. Your love is big enough to engulf the entire world. All we need to do today is accept it. We, we ask, Lord, that you would give your mercies and your grace and your love to those who are affected by the natural disasters that are going on in our world, the man-made disasters that are going on in this world today. Lord, calm the hearts away from all the political unrest that is going on and bring us back into being your people gathered together in your name, in grace, in mercy, and in love today. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have given us this grace openly and freely, and we just accept it today, Lord, to live it out each and every day of our lives. In your precious and holy name we pray today. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to end this portion of our service, for those of you online, thank you for joining us. Worship with us through the link that is in the, the comment section of the feed this morning. But hear this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go. Go.